Shall we pray? Shall we pray? Father, in Jesus' mm. name, we come before you. What a big, big God you are. You're a mighty mm. Father. Yes. Even to 2023, you're just moving in this room. Thank you. It is you who have led us to John chapter 11 as we as we come to study your word of God. And we just mm. believe that we are sowing the seed on a good soil with 30, 60, 100. It's not me, but it's uh, your Holy Spirit who's going to unpack the word today. And we just want to just not be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. You speak, oh Father. You take charge. In Jesus' name, we minister in your name alone. Amen. So uh, that's nice. L listening to all your interpretations and listening to the uh, pointers was so good. But I just want to uh, title this today's um, study as Death Defeater. What? Death Defeater. I was just thinking, what is the best title to call John chapter 11? And uh, John chapter 11, if you can't call it death defeater, nothing like it. So it, I would call it death defeater. So one more time, Vansi, thanks for encouraging us to uh, study this word, this topic. And uh, if, I mean, it's really powerful. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. So I think this, this topic, death defeater, is going to answer some of the basic questions which a lot of people ask us in our when you, whether you're, someone is a Christian or a non-Christian, but this is a basic question will get answered in that. But I want to tell you a little bit of introduction. What is this all about? Okay. Number one, if you want, if you're searching for the story in any of the gospels, you will not find it. <laughs> you will mm -hmm. only find the story of Lazarus, the family. The, uh, I don't know what their surname is all about, but uh, their second name, but uh, their I just put them as MML, the Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, the trio. Uh, you will not find your story anywhere. You will not in Ma Ma Matthew Gospel, Mark Gospel, Luke. You don't find. Only John records it. Only John records it. So that speaks. It's a very, very interesting one. And it's very incisive as well. We cannot afford to miss it. And it's uh, this miracle. We have been studying miracles, right? This miracle, if you see... Uh, Jesus performed the first miracle in a typical domestic home setup and is mm. one of his last final miracles. It's not, the, I would say the final great miracles is also for a family. So it starts with the family and then it's a, it's kind of mm. culminates in a family, right? That's, that's the way you can see that. And, uh, and uh, many a time, there are many statements we find, like Jesus says, I am the way, the, I am the truth and the life. Jesus says, I am the, I am the uh, resurrection. And he, he calls himself, I am the resurrection. But that's John chapter 11, verse uh, 25. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. There are like many, many I am statements, John records it, okay. And one of the biggest I am, I am statements, which you see, I am, I am, when he calls like, I am, I am the wine, right? Like you can put all the I am statements, you know, one of the, they, they say, this is the fifth I am statement, like I am the resurrection and the life. You cannot, it's John kind of pins it very nicely. So you may want to consider and think about that a minute. And I also want to tell you, people try hard to prove this is not a miracle what mm. people try hard to prove this is not a miracle why turn with me to john chapter 12 uh i uh, you the little bit further down you can see that john chapter 12 verse 9 meanwhile a large crowd of jews found out that jesus was there and came not only because of him but also to see lazarus whom he had raised from the dead so the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. Why? For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing. Look at the word, and believing in him. It's not then, it's even now. Today, people, people today want to stop people believing in Jesus because on the account of Lazarus so it's most of the time like people don't want to believe in Jesus let's stop let's kill Lazarus so that's the argument where people want to say Lazarus is not true or he's not 
it may be it's a fable, not really true, that kind of setup, that kind of argument is being built. So with this background, I just want to help you with this family. This family, when Jesus was engaging in ministry for last three years, 30 years he was a carpenter, only three years he was a miracle worker. So predominantly he's working. So 30 years carpenter, one, three years he was a miracle worker. The three years miracle worker in his ministry, most of the time, Jesus was very closely associated with his family, not just with one person in the family, but he is closely associated with every single member in the family. And this in this family, we get to see three people there. That is Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. I was also curious on the order, the ordinal positions of the sibling, like who comes first, mm. who comes second, mm. or was there a twin? I don't know. <laughs> mm. Like I was curious about all that, but uh, I see that uh, Jesus was um, Jesus was very close to this family. How do you find Jesus was very close to the family? If you can turn with me to the same chapter, John chapter 11, you will find uh, these verses which will tell how he is very close to the family. I'm going to read some couple of verses. Maybe you want to read verse 3. You want to read three, chapter 3. I mean, 11 verse 3. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. The Lord, mm -hmm. the one you love is sick. Go to verse 5 again. It says, so when he heard Lazarus was sick, he, he stayed there where he was for two more days. And then he said, said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. But then he talks about the verse 5 there. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. You can see too many compound words there. And, and, and. Jesus don't want to say like, you know, judge. I love the family, but Jesus wants to say, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and, and Lazarus. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking, why John has to stress so much, to stress mm -hmm. so much on saying like, you know, name by name, actually not needed. He could have just said, Jesus loved the family, but he didn't. And also you can go to verse 36. Then the Jew said, see how he loved him. So predominantly, you can see Jesus is very, very lovey-dovey to this family, very close to this family, no matter what. And Bethany is this, uh, is this like normal spot, right? People say it's like you, you can come because it's just three kilometers from Jerusalem, just three kilometers from Jerusalem. So most of the time, Jesus wants to do a kind of, a, uh, you know, he teaches at the temple courts. And he wants to have a coffee by evening. He just goes like two, 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 two to three kilometers. Just can slip away. And there, there's Mary, Martha, Lazarus always. And he can just stay, you know, got to stay overnight. Or he can be, you know, his disciples. It's not just Jesus alone. Jesus and his disciples were always treated well by this family. I don't know. You have seen certain houses where people really host uh, people who share the word, they we really, I've seen them, they host not just a, two people, three people, they host a dozen of people in their houses. And that's what Mary, Martha, and Lazarus family is all about. So it's a small village, but the love God had for that, he would just do a two minute, a two kilometer walk, and he would just be there for them all the time, whenever he needed, because you should not forget, he was teaching most of the time in the temple courts. Okay, I'm going to go into a little bit deeper. Today, you want to understand Jesus, um, if this is a miracle, if this is a miracle and you can for sure, you know that Jesus is living. I mean, Lazarus is Lazarus made alive or he, he got resurrected. I'm not going to go into the story holistically, but it is like for definite and for sure he is there. But I want to underline one word there. Who had the final word? Who had the final word? Did death have the final word or Jesus had the final word? I want you to think about it because we think that one of the fundamental foundations of this chapter 11, this brother died. I mean, he was sick, he died. And there he was four days, four days in the graveyard. And there you find 
death is not the final word. Jesus is the last final word because why it is very important today, death is a common denominator for anyone and everyone. Whether you're, just because you're a Christian, it doesn't mean you don't die, right? <laughs> you die. So why, you need to understand that. I want you to turn with, turn with me to Hebrews chapter two, verse 14 to 15. If, you want, if you're there, you can read Hebrews chapter two, verse 14 to 15. And there I can read it for you. It says, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that when he says he, Jesus too shared in their, in their humanity so that by his death, Jesus might break the power of him who holds the power of death. That is the devil. So who holds the power of death? And you need to have the very, very clear clarity. Death did not come from Jesus. Jesus did not create death. So who holds the power of death? The, who holds the power of death? That is the devil. And free those who are all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. One of the biggest, uh, um, if people have to, if you put a scale of anxiety, the highest level of anxiety is death. It's more than 100 points. That's, mm. a, that's a scale actually, where you have the, you can measure the level of anxiety in people, right? The mm. highest. So one of the enemy uh, enemy weapon or one of the strongest weapon used by devil is a fear of death. And that's what Hebrews chapter two, it says, who holds the power of death? That is the devil and free those who all their lives were held in slavery, kind of fear of death. Tell me how many people don't, even if you're going to talk to somebody 95 year old, 95 year old, you're fine. And then you're no, I don't want to die. 95 year old, you may ask them, they don't want to die, right? So fear of death is not someone at the age of five or age of 15, but it's a fear of death is a common. So it is, it is one of the oldest weapon used by Satan. And we need to understand where, who's managing the weapon and how, well, whether death, disease, decay, disappointment, despair, all that comes from this particular source, which is the devil. Now, if even if there is death, Jesus is the last word. And that's where we say, because Lazarus already died. It's not Jesus knew like this guy was like, okay, day two, he died. No, I want to walk you into that detail. Lazarus already died. Let, let, let us go there. How, how do we say Lazarus already died? By It says it took four days. Who said that? Who said that? To, to take go to chapter eleven, they say Martha says he's already be, been there for four days. What? Verse thirty nine has been there for four days. Then verse for seventeen, you can see that verse seventeen. What do you say? He has already been in the tomb for four days. Now, if you want to understand a little bit deeper, we want to go into those four days. Okay, now, if you want to understand four days, did Lazarus die before these people could go? Or after Jesus came, was he alive still? Or did he die then? Or when did Lazarus die? Let's go there. Now, this, this is verse two. You can go there, verse three. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. One you love is sick. So they took a messenger and they sent a messenger, okay? When the sick, when he said love is sick, when he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. So no, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Now, who does he say this to? He said, tell the messenger, go and tell this message to who? Martha and Mary, please go convey that message. Now, Jesus loved, I said. So, Coming to the next context here, if it is four kilo, if it is three kilometers from this part, where this side of Jerusalem, where he, it is closest, Bethany is closest to Jerusalem. Okay, now where is Jesus? You want to know where is Jesus? Jesus says that verse seven, and then he said to his disciple, "Let us go back to Judea. Let us go back to Judea." And where is Jesus? Verse 40 in chapter 10, verse 
I want you to go there, have your eyes there. Chapter 10, verse 40. Then Jesus went back, went back across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing in the early days. There he stayed. So practically, Jesus, like, uh, he heard the news and the location he is, to reach that location itself, it takes one day. For the messenger to come, to travel to Jesus is one day. And Jesus stayed in that location for two days, already three days gone. Now, if Jesus has to come back to the, come back to Martha and Mary, that's a day's journey. So that is why four days. Now you need to understand why four days. Let me give you another reason why it is four days. According to the Jewish uh, doctrine, Jew, according to the Jewish doctrine, okay, this is very interesting. When they usually believe if somebody is in a gravestone for three days, maybe there's a high chance if there's a possibility of resurrection, you know, that the soul wouldn't have gone far so they can bring back the, bring back the soul, uh, you know, the soul back to the body. So they believe. And But God wants to say, if Jesus has come on second day, these guys would have said, you know, we know, Come on, that's what the soul is here. It is not gone yet, right? So, mm -hmm. and Jesus said, okay, not two days, not three days. Jesus said four days. And he said four days. And that's the reason you find it's Jesus want to crash the defeat, the belief, the belief, the Jewish belief that they think that the soul remained in the body for three days. And mm -hmm. now even the hope of returning is gone. The hope of returning is totally mm -hmm. gone. And he wants to tell them, I am the resurrection and the life. Now, mm -hmm. if this is the foundation he wants to build, I just want to uh, ask three questions, okay? These are three questions which you want, which people will come and ask you. And you would have seen in your Christian walk as well. Number one, People can ask you these three questions. What we can learn from this particular family whom he really, really loved. Only bad people. The first question is, or first argument is, only bad people will get all this disease. You know, maybe you, you had a very bad sin. You did something really messy. That's why this is happening to you. Okay, second thing is, second belief is, if you have more faith, you will not get any problems at all. Little more faith, you will not have any problems. Life will be good. This is the second argument. Okay, and the third question people ask you is, if you're good, why evil? <laughs> if you say you're good, why evil? Think about all these things. I'm putting a lot of moral questions in your mind. That is what John chapter 11. Now, these three questions, these three questions were asked by three people. Turn with me. And those people are also asked the same question. Okay. You're good. You're perfect. You're sinless. And turn with me to the book of Job. Okay. And that's very, very interesting. Book of Job chapter 2. Chapter 2, and I'm going to read those, verse 11. When Job's three friends, Eliphaz, the Timonite, Bildad, the Shuhite, and Zophar, the Nematite, heard about all the troubles that had come upon him, they set out from their homes and met together to sympathize and comfort him. Now, Job writes, the book of Job runs for at least, I want to, I don't know how many times you've read this book, it runs 42 chapters, okay. At the end of 42nd chapter, what is the testimony about these three friends? The three friends were seven. After the Lord had said these things to Job, he said to Eliphaz, the Timonite, I'm angry with you and your two friends. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why? Because you have not spoken the truth about me as my servant Job has. What did they say? If you want to know, understand what did they say, that is what the three questions they said. Hey, you did something messy. You did something messy. Maybe you deserve that. Your sin is the reason and that's why you got it, okay? Second reason, maybe you, you need to be more holy. That's when you can become because all you see about Job 
yeah, I, I like job citation. He, he is known as faithful, upright, fierce God, and shun, shuns evil. Chapter one, verse one. Faithful, blameless, upright, fierce God, and shuns evil. Now, the same thing happened to our MML family, Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. I don't know what their neighbors spoke. Hey, the evangelist, the savior of the world, said to be the miracle worker comes to your house every day or every Sunday he's in your house. How come a death in your house? You have always Jesus with you. Why problems to you? You're worshiping Jesus all the time. Jesus is there with you. Why? Why? Why are you going through it? Four days now, nothing has seen. So my, uh, my question to you is some of the arguments, they can even work in these kind of arguments. I don't know. I, I really felt I should say those arguments to you. Think about it. The first argument they can come and say to you, he called you, you're very loving, right? He's very, very, if he's very loving to you, number one, why did he allow it? First question they'll ask you is this, right? Mary, Martha, if Jesus loves you so much, why should death come to your house? Number one argument, they can ask you that question. Why did, he, why did Jesus allow that to happen? Why did Jesus allow that to happen? Okay, that's the question they ask. Second question they ask is, you sent a message to Jesus three days back and your dear Jesus did not come back and the Bible says very clearly, having listened to that, he stayed there two more extra days. So the friends can ask another question. Uh, why did Jesus, you, your God was delaying. Why should he delay? Why should he delay? Because if he loves you, why did he delay? By now you should have got what you want. You shouldn't have had, number one, you shouldn't have had all this problem. Number two, you should have got this five years back. Why mm -hmm. are you getting it now? <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. What, what, how lousy it can be. And the third thing he can ask you is, just little further down, John, John chapter four, I don't have time. There is a official son. There's an official son who got healed. I mean, I, let me can read that. John chapter four, verse 53 and 54. Okay, the I can I can just read this. Then the father realized that this is, was the exact time at which Jesus has said to him, your son will live. Now, if you go mm -hmm. a little more further, the royal official said, sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus says, go, Jesus, go, Jesus replied, your son will live. The man took Jesus at his word and departed. While he was still on the way, his servants met him with the news that his boy was living. Now, there's another argument as well. See, foundationally, there shouldn't have been a problem. There shouldn't have been number death. There shouldn't have been a delay. Or even, even Jesus could have done a healing from where he is. Why Jesus has to come to the spot? Why Jesus has to come to the spot? He can do a healing at a distance, right? Why, sh why should he come to the spot? So these are some of the things that come, can come to us as well when we are battling with so many things right? People most of the time can come and tell you, you shouldn't be going through this at all. Number one, you shouldn't be going through this at all. But why did it happen? Why did it happen? My friend, I just want to tell you one thing, just because Jesus loves you, that doesn't seal you from your problems and pain in life. <laughs> just because Jesus loves you, just because you're a believer, it doesn't mean you will not have the problems and pains in life. If you say that argument is wrong, Jesus, God so loved the world, then why did Jesus go through the cross? He, should have, he shouldn't have had a, a need not carry the cross. Why should he drink the cup of sorrow? No, right? So the argument doesn't fit. It fits very clearly. Jesus wants to share three great themes, three themes. I just want to teach you that those three themes are we cannot compromise. Why did this whole episode or this miracle happen? It's just to teach us these three themes. Number one, if somebody asks why, why bad people, it should happen to bad people and all this kind of argument, we need to tell them. Number one, it very clearly says, 
I'm going to turn you to this particular verse. Jesus' initial message, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. What? It is for God's glory and for God's, and God's son may be glorified through it. God's glory is number one. God doesn't care about your healing and all that. Healing is secondary. And healing cannot overtake God's glory. God's glory is number one. It's a priority. If Jesus has to put it in a weighing scale, like, you know, is it God's glory? Or showing my love to Mary and Martha? No, he will say God's glory. Oh, no, Jesus, I need a healing. I need a financial need. I need a job. I need this. I didn't get it. No, God's glory. I, I need God's glory. You get why? Turn with me to Isaiah. I like this verse. I uh, use it almost every day and I find it very powerful. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 7. If you're there, you can read that. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 7. Isaiah 43, verse 7 says, Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. So you are practically in this earth for his glory. You're created for his glory. When, when the very moment he thinks like you're not there for the glory, that's it. God cannot give his glory to anybody. And that's what we have seen, right? Whether it is Satan falling down from heaven or God does not want his glory to be given to anyone. And he will not do any miracle or any wonder at the compromise of God's glory. Now, even to his most loved family, Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. Let's not forget that. And I just want to encourage you to turn with me to the second important theme. Number one is God's glory. Number two, I just want... So uh, before I could get into the second, many a time people talk today, we live in a very prosperity gospel, right? Come to Jesus. He'll make you happy. No, <laughs> he doesn't make He doesn't care about your happiness. He's more care, uh, worried about your holiness. Your, his, your prior, his priority is all about your holiness and his glory. And not at the compromise of whether how you feel. It's not about how you feel all the time. He's bigger than that. His God's glory is most important. The second question is the second theme you want to understand. He will, he did this. To increase the faith. What? First is to increase his glory. Second is to increase his faith. Whose faith? Increase the faith of his disciples. Increase the faith of the family. Martha, Mary, Lazarus. And increase the faith of the Jews who are there. I told you how he crashed the Jews by not even doing it on the third day. Because if he had done it, they wouldn't have believed. But he wants to crush, increase the faith of the family. Let's let's go there. I just want to go increase, uh, give you some example over there. How did he do it? Eight times in this small chapter, eight times you will have the word called believe. I can I can just go on reading in this. For example, if you can just uh, try, you can go on and count how many times. But I can. Uh, pick here and there for you at least minimum eight times you will find Martha answered look at that I am the resurrection and the life the one who believes in me will live okay next one one more time verse 26 believing in me will never die do you believe this then one more time you can go on and on then he says like mm, verse uh, one more time here 40 did I not tell you if that if you believe so believe, faith and believe, faith, the very word faith, faith is comes in the word believe, right? And the word believe is comes eight times here. What does it say? God is more interested on your faith part. No matter what, he doesn't skip on that. And by the way, faith operates the best way faith. How do you grow faith? Faith grows only by sufferings. Let's be very clear. Faith grows only through sufferings. It's like um, sometimes you ask, right? What, what can increase something else? And uh, only faith can increase that through sufferings. And faith is the only component that can make your faith level can grow. Nothing else. There's no shortcut. 
pain, suffering, pain, problem, suffering is the level one after the other, other can increase the level of the faith. Now, let, let's go into a more deeper understanding. I just want to give you more clarity into why, why I say that. Okay. Before you understand that, I want to tell you, before any faith or any challenge or suffering comes, God gives a promise. If you want to grow, faith, if the faith has to be tested through suffering, God gives a promise. What is your promise for 2023? I don't know, but there is a promise given to Martha and Mary. What is the promise? It says, verse 4, the messenger came and said, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's man, God's son may be glorified. So these people already have a promise. Now, the promises will not end in death. It, they are confused. You get what I'm saying? The messenger comes and says, hey, he already died. What are you trying to say? He already died. And now you're saying will not end in death. And by the way, don't forget Martha and Mary doesn't have a New Testament in their hand. What they have is an Old Testament book until Old Testament. You and me understand resurrection better, but they do not have that. And I would not even come back and say, Martha had this much faith, Mary had less faith or something like that. I wouldn't say that. But then I would just say what, what they all had was the Old Testament until their understanding. Maybe they would have read about Daniel chapter 12, where it is, couple of verses on resurrection you can understand right verse two and three but i just want to give you a little more understanding into this particular verse so faith comes to the promise and the promise only gets released by the power of god your promise can gets released only by the power of god there are two characters we are going to go into understanding the faith okay two characters one character who was with jesus and this character and uh, half the people in this, in this place who is in the skull are from that land where Apostle Thomas, the doubting Thomas visited India. Let's not forget. This doubting Thomas, uh, he, he's, uh, he came to the land of many gods. Why? Because God, he had a nature to doubt everything. Okay, but he's very devoted. What did he say? Verse 16. Then, Joe, then Thomas, also known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. <laughs> this guy already thought Jesus is not going for healing. He thought Jesus is also going to go there and die. Let me also, let us all go and die with him. That's the kind of answer he gives because he already, I mean, the Bible calls him pessimist because he thinks like, okay, Jesus is going to die. So let's all go and die with him. That's his statement. And Jesus in the road, let's not forget Jesus is in a very, very sticky place because coming into Bethany, he can be arrested anytime. Let's not forget that. But he says, and he's thinking maybe he's going into Bethany, maybe he can be, he'll be die, he'll die as well. So that is what it is. The same Thomas, John chapter 20, John records this. In fact, not many of them. John records that. And he says, if only I see, like John chapter 20, he says, uh, I'm going to read that verse for you. Verse 24 to 28. It says, unless, verse 25, unless I see the nail marks in his hand and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. This is Thomas. This is Thomas' personality. I want to tell you, there is someone who is with Jesus. This is his level of faith. His level of faith is there. He's thinking, I don't know how, what is, if you put like one to hundred, what is his faith points? I don't know, but that is his level of faith. Likewise, our faith levels in this room are not same points. Maybe Vanessa, you are like 95. Somebody is 75 or someone is 65 or someone is 45. I don't know. But what is the faith level? But the purpose you have to see, this Thomas, God used that Thomas because the end of Thomas is to, so that he has to manage lots of doubting people. The lot of doubting people in India who worship idols. And that's why God wanted him that kind of affirmation, right? 
There is a second person which is called, I want to go a little bit travel. I think, um, Vanati, you just brought this person into your note, which is um, Martha. Let's go deeper. Always we think Martha is not given a lot of attention and sometimes we make a biblical interpretation like Martha, I mean, Mary chose the one part and Martha did not, okay? And I let me explain a little bit of uh, the, these two characters. These sisters are very interesting. Okay, if you have a sister, you know what it is. It's very interesting. And you're not definitely, most of the time, you and your sister are not the same, right? Now, Martha and Mary are definitely are not the same in any way. But you, you cannot miss. Both Martha and Mary use the same line. Why? Verse 21. Who said, Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Okay, now travel with me to here which is verse 32. This is Mary saying, Mary saying, Lord, if you had been here, my, my brother would not have died. It's like a parrot. Both of them are reciting the same verse, same line, same expression. It looks like they have been talking all the time. If Jesus has been with us, we wouldn't have, you know. It's like a real, real natural expression. So I wouldn't call that uh, these two sisters um, are completely different in the way they have their faith levels. Now let's travel there. For all the time you saw Mary, Mary's postures always are at Jesus' feet. Why three times it comes, Jesus, Mary, you can find Mary's location. If you put a GPS vest, Mary, Mary will always be at Jesus' feet because either you spot her at, uh, she, Martha serving and she's like, she's at Jesus' feet and here he com she comes what she does, verse 32, she fell at his feet one more time. And then if you go to chapter 12, she pours on Jesus' feet. What? The perfume. So all the three times you spot Mary in the gospel, she's always at Jesus' feet. Okay. Now, coming just because she's at Jesus' feet does not, does not mean her level of faith was uh, different. Now, look at that. I want you to understand uh the faith levels where is martha let's take that okay martha is a real doer <laughs> what martha is a real doer she does things she wants to get it done that's that's how Ma martha whereas mary morning morning of mary she doesn't, she's speechless. She's more reflective, she's more contemplative. I know perhaps she's an introspective person you know, very introverted. She is like, she is like when she meets Jesus, she's not able to speak what she says. When Jesus saw her weeping, she's only weeping. She's speechless. Whereas the same Martha, if you, if you go there, verse 21, she dialogues with Jesus like anything. Her brother passed away, but she dialogues. You look at that, verse 21. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been near, my brother wouldn't have, would, would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Look at the way she talks. She wants to talk. She wants to find out. She wants to, you know, get things done. So now, and it is only Martha, if you find, she articulates where she says, I know, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection in the last day. Let me walk you first. Faith levels of maturity, I said, varies and it even grows look at that like five years ten years back what was your faith level the amount of problems and mountains you have crossed what's your faith level and Simran what problems you had I wouldn't have had right and the mountains you climbed is different and your faith level is completely different but the question is let's walk with the first maturity levels both these ladies they use the word called if if you have been here so they know with Jesus on their side, Lazarus wouldn't have died. Both the times these people said that, if you have been here, that's the first level of maturity and affirmation they showed, okay? The second level of maturity, I just want to tell you, she is saying, verse 23, it says, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Now, Jesus is talking about here and now, and our friend Martha thinks, 
Lord, I know he will rise again in the resurrection in the last day. So she's talking about future, future resurrection. And Jesus is talking about here and now. Why? Because Martha is having an Old Testament and she doesn't know the resurrection will happen. She knows. She doesn't think like it will not happen, but it will happen later. That's what she believes, right? So that's the second maturity. Third maturity, I just want to tell you, where she goes and says, Jesus gives her, this is the culmination, I think, where uh, where you have been saying, uh, Vanti, where Jesus says, okay, you believe in me, right? You believe in me that it's going to happen. Then go take away the stone. Verse, verse 39, that is like faith in action. Faith in action, if no faith in action, faith without action is dead. James writes that, right? Faith without action is dead. And God gives a real calling there, real, real instruction. Go take away the take away the stone. What's the starting line? What's the starting word? The starting word there is, but <laughs> Lord said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time this, there is a bad order for he has been there four days. I don't know. Most of the time for us to say no is the word called but, where we say like, I don't know. Lord, but. I know you are, but. Lord, but. Think about that. that that's the third level of maturity. But I just want to tell you one thing. Romans 12.3 tells you faith is the level of faith. It's distributed. It's distributed. Not everyone is strong and mountain level of faith like Stephen, not everybody has that. Someone is like at a mustard level, right? Your faith is more distributed because that's what the Bible says. I'm going to read that verse for you. Chapter 12, verse 3, it says, be, uh, verse, verse 3, it says, rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each one, each of you. So there's no point in condemning, oh, my friend Martha had more faith or Mary had more faith, Mary had less faith. No, but it is Martha you find where she says, she openly says, verse 27, this is the climax. She says, I believe that you are the Messiah, the son of God who came into this world. She unpacks a very big truth. She unpacks a very big truth. Nobody has told that. Nobody, not even the disciples said that. So that is a very, very big statement there. But I leave it, want to leave that with you. Their faith levels are completely different. And whether it's where you're an introvert or you're an extrovert, God is there for you. That's what is more important. God wants to bring that, uh, unpack that story. And third, third reason, if somebody says like, you know, you're, you're only bad people should be your, you did this a mess. That's why it's, but the third reason I like what it's divine timetable. What? It's a divine timetable. Turn with me to this particular verse. It says, verse nine, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble for they see by this world's light. This he answers, uh, to the, to the Jews, he answers. Okay. Because he, when he says like, let us go back to Judea and go and do ministry. But if you want to understand a little more, Jesus had a very, that's why I, I always talk to people and say, I don't know what's your plan and purpose. What's your plan and purpose for you? What's God is your time. You have an expiry date. We do not know how many birthdays we have because Psalm 139 says before a word, before a day comes to pass, before a a day comes to pass before one of them. It's all written in your book, 139. I'm going to read that verse for you. Psalm, one, turn with me to Psalm 139. That's a very powerful uh, text. By then we know th these, are the, these are the, like somebody is going to have 70 birthdays. Someone is going to have only seven birthdays. Verse 16, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. So how many birthdays are you going to have, Viji? God knows. Jesus knows how many birthdays you're going to have. But it's also important if that means it's a very tightly packed schedule. Jesus has a very tight schedule, like every time. Because you turn with me to John chapter 2, 4, he will find, he will say, John 2, 4, it says, where Jesus asks, his mom comes and asks him to do a miracle. You know what he says? To my hour has not yet come. 
okay then chapter 7 6 chapter 7 and 6 uh, uh, john chapter 7 verse 6 he says uh, Jesus, therefore jesus told them my time is not yet here for you have you any time will do the world cannot hate you but it hates me because i testify that it works are evil you go to the festival i'm not going up to this festival because my time has not yet fully come okay then you can read in chapter 12 i there are so many verses to show god operates on a divine time schedule okay it's a very sovereign time schedule john chapter 12 verse 23 if you're there you will know he says the hour has come for the son of man to be glorified so there is an hour has already come so the time has not come the time so he knows what it is now you need to understand it's a very strategic one it's a very strategic uh, miracle because according to the divine time schedule there should be many triggers to happen for the culmination of arrest and crucifixion and resurrection of jesus Jesus knew if he's going to come and do the resurrection of Lazarus, he is, his crucifixion is going to be a week away. Let me repeat it. Jesus knew if he is going to come and do the resurrection of Lazarus, because when Lazarus comes alive, what happens? That's where the plot happens. People are saying, what is the people saying? Verse 48 if we let him go on like this everyone will believe in him and then the romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation so jesus knew if he comes and resurrects lazarus he's going to die soon jesus knew it jesus knew it and jesus knew that knowing that he's going to die he walked into death you want to understand the context, knowing he's going, he's going to be nearing his death in a week's time. Next week, I'm opening the tomb of Lazarus today. Next one week from now, somebody will be taking, my tombstone will be removed. So that's what you can see here. So he, you needed a trigger. That's, that's very classic to understand. So he knew his death. He knew Lazarus' death, Lazarus death is for his death to come very very quickly i just want to understand one last thing at the end of all this at the end of all this you find jesus the death defeater coming to our title he is the death defeater he the, has the ultimate say can you ever thought why jesus cried the shortest verse in the whole bible is here it's everyone says this the shortest verse in the whole bible is jesus wept any idea why Jesus wept? Why did Jesus, Jesus wept? Verse 35. Why did Jesus, well, why did Jesus cry? Or why did Jesus weep? I really thought about it. Because if you see two verses above, it says, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Some Certain translation will say indignant. Uh, Viji, uh, in your Tamil translation, what is it? What word does it come? Verse 33? 1133? You're reading, Viji? Yeah, I'll read it, Akka. Uh, go on, Suniva. When Jesus saw her weeping and saw the other people wailing with her, a deep anger welled up within him. Deep anger? Why should Jesus feel angry? And then the verse comes, Jesus wept. Now, we, we people, we, I tell you, most of us will get confused when we think, oh my God, Jesus went to a funeral, so therefore he cried. No, it's beyond that. Why should he get angry there? If he wants to cry, he would have cried, but there was an anger there. Why? Why was he angry? And then, he's, then he, he wept. So he wept, he got angry for something, but weep for something you get what i'm saying now the greek understanding of that where did because death is not he created death belongs to the devil and his friend lazarus is taken away by death and he is thinking if i have to go bring lazarus out 
think about the classic year. I really love this thought. If I have to, Jesus knew Lazarus has already gone to heaven, right? If I have to bring Lazarus back, I'm bringing him back to the most, most tragic thing because he's, he, we, we don't know how is heaven, but he knows, Jesus knows he's from heaven. He knows he's already the best spot. And this guy, when he comes back, it's going to be the, to the tragic world because Lazarus has to die again. Lazarus has to die again. So death is not something Jesus created. And Jesus think that's the most, most, the biggest enemy the devil could create. And he is angry. He's angry against not anyone, but the devil where he has created the death. And today our friend Lazarus went and I have to go bring him from the other side. And by the way, Lazarus know what is life on the other side. No one knows what's the interview. No one, maybe a couple of interviews, media people got after him. You will find what Lazarus had that three, three nights or wherever, how he was. But then when he come back, he knows he's coming back to the pain, problem, death, disease, decay world. My friend, I just want to tell you, this is the Christian hope we have. It's whatever you're going through in your life. When people give you some interpretation, it is like maybe you're getting a punishment for it. Maybe Lazarus did something. That's why he's going to go through it. No, it's God's glory. To increase God's glory, it is increase your faith. And it is to align to the divine timetable. Shall we pray? Father, in Jesus' name, we come before you. What a big God you are, O oh Lord. Nothing in our life happened by accident. You create incident. Today, oh, you told us very clearly, we are created for your glory. Glorify your name through everything, oh God, everything we do. And I know it's hard, it's painful, but you just do it for your glory, oh God. Help us to align, help us to obey your, obey in you for you so that we know that you're, you're, we grow in you for your faith after faith, strength to strength, oh God, so that we believe and we know what no matter what, you're a good, good father. Above all, oh God, it's your divine schedule in our life. You already know how many birthdays, oh God. Help us to just do what you have kept us in our life and the real hope that you are coming. And nobody in this world have that. And you have defeated the death. Thank you for that real hope you have given us. In Jesus' name we receive. Amen. God bless. Any question?